Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we have just sung the words that you wrote through the Apostle Paul to the church that you loved in Ephesus. And through that church to churches that would be built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets until you take the church home. And we are in that train of your grace and your blessing and your mercy and your favor. We thank you so much for this letter we get to study this evening. We thank you for your word and its power. We pray that we would live by the script of this marvelous explanation of your gospel and its work. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Well, I trust that since you are here at Grace Bible Church, the book of Ephesians will be no stranger to you. Uh, This book has been foundational for our church, and it seems to crop up in many places, uh, all the nooks and crannies of this church, and and rightfully so, the book of Ephesians is a marvelous ecclesiology in letter form. That is a study of what the church ought to be. And Scott Maxwell preached this book verse by verse from June 28, 2009 through February 6, 2011. If you started coming to Grace Bible Church during that time, you may be able to date your arrival by chapter and verse of Ephesians. Is that true, Stephen? (laughs) Somewhere in there. And it, it has been so foundational for this church. If you want the full story, tonight you get a summary of the book of Ephesians, but if you want the full story, I would commend to you the verse by verse exposition of Ephesians that is available on the website. The book of Ephesians was John Calvin's favorite book. And maybe it is your favorite book. And so something like giving a book report on your favorite book, I am bound in my explanation to leave out your favorite verses, your favorite topics, the things you think I should have talked about because it's your favorite. (laughs) This book is a favorite of mine as well. I was in high school in a Calvary Chapel in Southern California, and the, the first place I had heard expository preaching, where somebody up front explained God's Word verse by verse, word by word, through a book. And the book was Ephesians. And I will never forget being a high schooler, a freshman in high school, hearing Ephesians chapter 1 explained. And what happens in Ephesians chapter 1 is the foundation of this book and then the foundation of the Christian life and the foundation of the church is this great big view of a sovereign and saving God. This is just good news. And we just sung it and we get to look at it in brief tonight. And so if Ephesians is already your best friend, I hope that I don't ruin it for you. And maybe... If you don't know Ephesians very well, this will whet your appetite to study it for a lifetime. I want to tell you just a little bit about the background of the church at Ephesus. It's going to help us understand why Paul was doing what he was doing and why particularly Jew-Gentile relationships and unity and love were so important in this letter. First, I'm just going to give you the broad outline of the book. Here it is in two points. You can walk away with this. You can memorize the outline of Ephesians very quickly. It's already up there for you on the screen. The book of Ephesians breaks down into two major parts, the truth you need to know and the life you need to live. The truth you need to know in the first three chapters, the life you need to live in the last three chapters. And this is very Pauline. You get truth and doctrine as a foundation for how to live. There are things you need to know that become the platform for the way you need to live. Ephesians nicely breaks down into that very typical Pauline outline. And you can notice throughout the book the therefores. There are big statements of theological truth and then the therefores about how to live out your life. So that's the broad outline. Turn in your Bible to the book of Acts. We want to see, first of all, sort of the birth of this church. It'll help set the stage for the letter that Paul writes to it. Paul, as you know, was the apostle designated by Jesus to take the gospel to Gentile territories. Ephesus was in Gentile territories. It was in Asia. And when we think about Asia, uh, perhaps we think about Russia and China, the Far East, the Middle East, and those kinds of things. Asia, in the era of the New Testament, was a reference to what is now modern-day Turkey. 
Uh, that would be Asia Minor, and that's where the letters to the seven churches in Revelation takes place. Ephesus was the first and most prominent city in that land that is now called Turkey. So clearly this is Gentile territory. The apostle of the Gentiles has made his way out from Jerusalem, around the Mediterranean, up to what is now modern-day Turkey, and to this really important city called Ephesus. Look down at verse 19 of Acts 18. Paul and his associates, he's got Priscilla and Aquila with him, arrived at Ephesus, and he left them there. He entered the synagogue and he reasoned with the Jews and they asked him to stay for a longer time. He did not consent. He took leave of them and said, I will return to you if God wills. So that's Paul's first stop and he stops in at the synagogue first. Remember he explained the gospel as the grace of God which went to the Jew first and then to the Gentile. That was Paul's practice even in Gentile territory to stop in at the synagogue and preach there Jesus as the Christ. Turn to Acts 19. Here you have Paul in Ephesus again, verse 1. It happened that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul passed through the upper regions and came to Ephesus and found some disciples. And these were followers of John the Baptist. They had been baptized into, into John's ministry. That was a baptism of repentance. They had not yet received the Holy Spirit nor been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul explained these things to them. They were baptized into Christ. And then in verse 8, Paul entered the synagogue. And he continued speaking boldly for three months, reasoning and persuading them about the kingdom of God. You get the impression that some believers came out of Paul's interactions in the synagogue there at Ephesus. And then it says in verse 9, when some were becoming hardened and were not believing, speaking evil of the way before the multitude, he left them, took away the disciples, and began reasoning daily in the school of Tyrannus. This took place for two years, so that all who lived in Asia heard the word of the Lord, both Jews and Greeks. So Paul goes to the Gentile population of the church at Ephesus, which is the central and first and most prominent city in the area from which all other business would be conducted, such that the entire region is filled with the knowledge of the gospel proclaimed by Paul and his associates and the new believers at Ephesus. You get a flavor of the radical transformation the gospel took at Ephesus down in verse 18. Many of those who had believed kept coming and confessing and disclosing their practices. Many of those who practiced magic brought their books together and were burning them in the sight of everyone and they counted up the price of them and found it 50,000 pieces of silver, that's 50,000 days wages, worth of magic books burned in repentance in the city square. And verse 20 tells us the word of the Lord was growing mightily and prevailing. This is remarkable. Uh, this was no small thing. This was a very public demonstration of abandoning an old life of ways of darkness and walking in futility of mind and slavery to sin and spiritual deadness and walking in light and life in the gospel of Christ. It was costly. It was obvious. It was very public. And so the church grew and the word of the Lord abound, uh, abounded. Paul was there most likely two and a half to three years, probably 53 to 56 A.D. And then in 57 A.D., after leaving, Paul came back close to Ephesus. Uh, he didn't get all the way to the city. He didn't want to stop there on his way to Jerusalem. It would take too much time. But he called the elders of the church at Ephesus to visit him at a place called Miletus on the coast. And we see the record of that in Acts 20, verse 17. Paul says, from Miletus, he sent to Ephesus and called to him the elders of the church. So by this time, there is a, a functioning church with a plurality of shepherds. And when they came to him, he said to them, you yourselves know from the first day that I set foot in Asia, how I was with you the whole time, slaving under the Lord with all humility and with tears and with trials that came upon me through the plots of the Jews. I did not shrink from declaring to you anything that was profitable, teaching you publicly and from house to house. Verse 24, he says, I don't make my life of any account dear to myself so that I may finish my course and the ministry I received from the Lord Jesus 
to testify solemnly of the gospel of the grace of God. This perspective, thinking little of himself and thinking greatly of the gospel of God, compelled Paul, and the Ephesian elders had seen this. Verse 27, Paul says, I did not shrink from declaring to you the whole purpose of God. And then he says, be on guard for yourselves and for all the flock, among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. And then Paul warns them that savage wolves would come in and some would even rise up from their own number and be a threat to the church. Paul had invested at the church at Ephesus. He had invested in the leadership of the church at Ephesus. He clearly saw the church itself as precious, bought by the very blood of God. And so when he writes his letter to the Ephesians in 61 AD, some four years later, you get a sense of Paul's love and investment in this church. When Paul writes his letter, he is in Rome and he is in chains. We see that he is in prison in chapter 3, verse 1. He writes, I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, on behalf of you Gentiles. And then at the end of the letter in chapter 6, verse 20, he says, I am an ambassador in chains. That picture ought to flavor the way we read the letter. If you read a letter from somebody who was incarcerated for fidelity to the gospel, you might read through the lens of suffering, of selflessness, and, and the love that comes from, well, I can pray for you, and here's how I pray. I need to instruct you, and here's the letter. You would probably hang on every word of a letter like this, uh, as if every word was written so carefully. We have in this letter um, perhaps an overarching theme. What is the book of Ephesians about? I, I would put it in the, in the framing of the way we talk about missions. The glory of God in the gospel of Christ in the church at Ephesus. That's what this letter is about. It is the glory of God, supremely about God and His glory. And that glory is seen supremely in the gospel of Jesus Christ, which saves individual sinners and unites them together in the body of Christ, the church. And then we see all of that localized in how individual Christian lives are to be lived and how they are to be lived together in the church. So we'll break down the, the letter into its two major parts. First three chapters, the truths you need to know, and then chapters four to six, the life you need to live. Look down at chapter one with me. The first truth that Paul lays out here is the glory of God in redemption. And we just sang that in the, in the song uh, just before I came up, and we'll sing that song again as we close this evening. But I want you to notice redemption as the theme of the first 14 verses and the termination of that theme of redemption is the glory of God. Everything God does in salvation does not terminate in love for the sinner. It certainly involves and overwhelms and envelops this idea of love for sinners. But all of that is subservient to the great, big, glorious terminus, which is the glory of God in the saving of sinners. Notice how Paul says this. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, verse 3 who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, just as He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world, that we would be holy and blameless before Him in love, by predestining us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to Himself, according to the good pleasure of His will, to the praise of the glory of His grace, which He graciously bestowed on us in the Beloved." In Him we have redemption through His blood, forgiveness of transgressions, according to the riches of His grace, which He caused to abound to us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of His will, according to His good pleasure, which He purposed in Him. For an administration of the fullness of the times, that is, the summing up of all things in Christ, things in the heavens and things on the earth, in Him. In Him we have also been made an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of Him who works all things according to the counsel of His will, to the end that we who first have hoped in Christ would be to the praise of His glory. 
In Him, you also, after listening to the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, having also believed, you were sealed in Him with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is given as a pledge of our inheritance unto the redemption of God's own possession, to the praise of His glory. And that phrase, the refrain, to the praise of His glory, occurs three times in this sort of accelerating doxology. All of it ends in God. And you see all the way through there the the God-centeredness of the gospel that saves us. He predestines. He acts according to the counsel of His will. He, He does all these things which benefit us in infinite measure for the purpose of putting His own glory on display. This is the really remarkable thing about God's grace is that God getting glory and God saving sinners in love are not at odds with each other. Actually, God gets glory for the demonstration of what He is like and who He is by saving sinners. And we see that on this remarkable peon of praise in Ephesians 1. It has been said that the sentence I just read is the longest single sentence in ancient Greek literature. (laughs) It's this wonderful, run-on sentence that you would have failed a grade in English class for writing. And God gets all the glory. Paul's pen just could not stop and put a period in there. It just keeps going and going and going. The next truth that we find in the book of Ephesians begins in verse 15, and it is the knowledge of God in redemption. We just saw the glory of God in redemption, and and now Paul moves on to knowing God personally. We need to know the God who saves. And this truth comes out in a prayer. It's pretty remarkable. Verses 15 to 23 are actually Paul's recording of the way he prays for the Ephesians. This is instructive for us and how we ought to pray. It's doctrinally rich. It's God-centered, it's dependent, it's compassionate. But listen to the richness of this prayer and, and the theology that comes through it. It is actually instructive. Paul says in verse 15, For this reason, I too, having heard of the faith in the Lord Jesus which is among you, and your love for all the saints, I do not cease giving thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers. What do I pray? Paul says, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the full knowledge of Him, so that you, the eyes of your heart having been enlightened, will know what is the hope of His calling, what are the riches of His glory and His inheritance in the saints, and what is the surpassing greatness of His power toward us who believe according to the working of the might of His strength, which He worked in Christ by raising Him from the dead and seating Him at His right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And He put all things in subjection under His feet and gave Him His head over all things to the church, which is His body, the fullness of Him who fills all in all. Paul says, I pray that you would know God. Insert theological treaties about God. (laughs) You need to know these things. The truths that are laid out in this prayer are not for the theologians out there somewhere to work out. They are for Christians to know. Paul actually prayed that the believers at Ephesus would know these things. And and, and notice the scope of this knowledge. Um, We need wisdom and and revelation in the full knowledge of God with our eyes of our heart enlightened so that we would have the hope of our calling. That calling is a past reality. What are the riches of the glory of His inheritance? A future reality. And then the power of His working in us is a present reality. From eternity past to our own personal salvation's history, through the present of the Christian life, all the way into future glory, Paul prays the Ephesians would know these things and and that we would know these things. The next set of truth that we need to know 
comes in chapter 2. And I'm confident this is familiar territory. We need to know the saving grace of the gospel. We find this in Ephesians 2, 1 to 10. It starts with the really bad news, the reality of the situation of our birth and our existence before Christ. And you were dead. You were dead. Paul indicts the human situation with a descriptor that seems counterintuitive. You think, well, before I knew Jesus, I I, I was walking around on the earth. Paul affirms that. He says, you were dead in the realm of your transgressions and sins in which you formerly walked. As John Wayne once said, you might be walking around, but you're dead as a beaver hat. That is the description of the spiritual condition of someone outside of Christ. Spiritually dead. And let me ask you, what is a spiritually dead person able to do in the spiritual realm? Nothing. The the point of this assessment, the point of this prognosis, is so that we understand the reality of the human condition apart from grace. The human condition apart from the gospel. Hopeless, helpless. There's nothing a dead person can do for himself. There's there's no remedy of that condition. And this spiritual death was in the realm of transgressions and sins, just piling on more enmity to God. And it was a walk. You walked in them. And you walked according to the standard of this world's course, this world's track. And according to the operation of the ruler of the power of the air. He's talking about Satan, the spirit now working in the sons of disobedience. And among those sons of disobedience, we also formerly conducted ourselves or or lived in the lusts of our flesh. We were doing the desires of the flesh and the desires of the mind. And by nature, we were children of wrath. Well, this is a a hopeless condition. Under satanic governance, along with the peer pressure of all the sons of disobedience, doing what came naturally to us, which was only in the realm of spiritual death. Totally hopeless situation. And verse 4, we get the, the contrastive conjunction and the title for God in the most remarkable turn one could ever think of, but God. Our hopeless, helpless condition is only altered by these two wonderful grace words, but God, being rich in mercy. How much mercy would it take to help out someone like us? (laughs) Infinite riches of mercy. Because of his great love with which he loved us. How much love would it take to love us, the unlovable, in that condition? God's great and infinite love. Even when we were dead in our transgressions, God made us alive together with Christ. This just takes us back to chapter 1 and the God-centeredness of redemption. God initiates. Why? Because in Ephesians 2, we couldn't do anything. Only God can make the dead live. This is supernatural stuff. He made us alive together with Christ and then he, he, he can't even get to the, the end of the punchline yet. He has to insert the end right here. By grace you've been saved. Can't wait to get to that part. And then he continues, he made us alive together with Christ and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. And you're thinking, wait, Those things haven't happened yet. Why is Paul talking about them as if they're in the past? Because they are done. There is a reality to your identity in Christ that is already at the finish line. Why, verse 7? So that in the ages, plural, to come, God might show the surpassing riches of His grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. That takes us back to chapter one and the doxological purpose to the praise of the glory of his grace. Why does God make alive that which was spiritually dead? For his own glory. By the way, do you feel somehow slighted in that? Left out in that? 
It's actually really encouraging that the whole plan of redemption isn't about me, but about something infinitely bigger than me. It terminates in the glory of God. And then you get the summary statement, verse 8, for by grace you have been saved through faith, very precise technical language, grace saves you through what venue? Through faith. And this is not of yourselves. And I believe that this refers to the entire grace through faith package. The grace through faith package, is, it's not of you. It is the gift of God. It's not of works so that no one could boast. Which is just the natural corollary to everything we've read so far. God initiates salvation for His own glory for people who could not do anything for themselves. Of course, of course no works could save you. Of course this had to be all of grace. And the grace continues, verse 10. Don't separate verse 10 from verses 8 and 9. There's a conjunction there that puts them together. See the word for in verse 10. For we are His workmanship. Created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. Don't miss this in the great plan of salvation. Uh, salvation through grace, by grace through faith, a salvation that saves, saves you unto good works. Good works are not a part of the saving package, but they are the result of it. What does God save you unto? Good works that He prepared that we walk in. Pretty remarkable statement. Again, this is all of God. What follows in verses 11 to 22 moves us from the saving grace of the gospel to the unifying grace of the gospel. Verses 1 to 10 deals with the individual Christian standing before God. How does an individual Christian get saved? Verses 11 to 22 deals with us together in the salvation plan of God in unity. And you have to move yourself back a couple thousand years to the era of the, of the first century church, to Ephesus, where there was a synagogue and some Jews getting saved by hearing the gospel proclaimed by this Jew who's an apostle to the Gentiles, and then a bunch of Gentiles getting saved and project whatever ethnic tensions come to your mind in our present day world and, and sort of project those onto the ancient world, you'll probably get pretty close about the kind of ethnic tensions that existed between Jew and Gentile in the first century. Jews who knew the Old Testament and knew that Jesus was the Old Testament's Messiah who had come and and now their fellowship of, of following the Bible is flooded by a bunch of Gentiles who are outsiders and strangers to such things. And they look different, and they talk different, and they eat different. What are we going to do with them? And this created a significant dilemma all over the ancient world, wherever the gospel went, but particularly so at Ephesus. And so 11 to 22 details for us this, how does the gospel unify Jew and Gentile? Therefore, remember, verse 11, that formerly you, the Gentiles, fleshly speaking, some people call you uncircumcision. Uh, the so-called circumcision calls you that. But remember that at that time without Christ, you were alienated from the citizenship of Israel. You were strangers to the covenants of promise. You had no hope and you were without God in the world. But now, in Messiah Jesus, in Israel's Messiah, you who were formerly far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. And listen, if the blood of Christ brings Jew and Gentile together, who's going to separate them? Who should be in there making divisions, ethnic strife? distinctions between them. Nobody should be doing that. The blood of Christ brought them together. Now look at verse 14. For He Himself, that is Jesus Himself, is our peace, who made both groups one. And He broke down the dividing wall of the partition. What's the dividing wall of the partition? Well, 
It was all the things in the ancient Israelite theocracy under Mosaic law that actually made distinctions. Things like circumcision, things like dietary restrictions. Um, There was so many Mosaic law commandments that separated Israel out from the nations as a peculiar people. For Jew and Gentile now to become one in Christ, in this new thing called the church, that barrier had to come down. Look at verse 15. He abolished in his flesh the enmity. What, What enmity? The law of commandments contained in the ordinances, so that in himself he might create the two into one new man, making peace. And he might reconcile them both in one body to God through the cross having in himself put to death the enmity. And so he came and preached the good news of peace to you who are far away and peace to those who are near, to Gentiles and to Jews. For through him we both have our access in one spirit to the Father. So Gentiles, you're no longer strangers, no longer aliens to the promises. You are fellow citizens with the saints, with the separated ones, and you are of God's household. This has particular impact for most of us of Gentile lineage. We forget the tension. We're so far removed from it. This is such remarkable good news. And notice this new entity, this one new man. You've got to follow the argument all the way down to verse 20. This one new man with the barrier of dividing wall broken down is now built on a foundation. This is new. The, the church was born in Acts 2. And so this Jew and Gentile together in one body is a, is a new feature in God's redemptive plan. Later in the book of Ephesians, Paul will call it a mystery. Uh, the, the ages past didn't see this coming. Jew and Gentile together in one body, and now it has this new foundation. What is the foundation? The apostles and the prophets. And the word order is important there. The apostles, of course, are the disciples of Jesus, the the 11, then the 12, the 13, however many there were, um, that that become the foundation. In other words, it has its starting point in the book of Acts. And then the prophets. These are New Testament prophets. If Paul had meant the Old Testament prophets, he might have put them first. But he says the New Testament apostles and the New Testament prophets... And then he specifies Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone. Cornerstone was the first stone set down at the foundation level. And this is Messiah Jesus. Notice he is named Jesus the Nazarene. This is a New Testament reality. This church is a new feature in God's redemptive plan. And then he calls it this whole building being joined together is growing into a holy sanctuary in the Lord. In Christ, you are also being built together into a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. So this unity, this unifying grace in the gospel is critical as a foundation piece for how believers were to live in the church. I don't know that we feel the Jew, Gentile, ethnic tension in our day, but there are principles there for us about anybody who is in Christ Their identity is in Christ. They are already seated with Him in the heavenlies, saved by the same grace of the gospel, no matter what they look like or what they eat or what they wear. If they are in Christ, they are rightful members of God's household, and there should be no ethnic tension. There is one new man. That's our identity. It's a really remarkable thing the gospel does a unifying grace to bring people from all kinds of different backgrounds that might not in the real world find themselves to be friends, find themselves to be best friends in the gospel in God's church. What you have in chapter 3, verses 1 to 13, is the unfolding of the mystery of the church. And and I'd like to read the whole thing. We're, We're running out of time here. Um, that is Paul's sort of purpose statement for why He is the apostle that he is. It is the stewardship of his ministry of the mystery of God's grace in the church. And read this section. Paul just doesn't get over the fact that this is a gift. He says over and again, I've been made a minister. It's a gift of God's grace. It was given to me. The very least of all the saints, it was given to me. Paul just can't get over the fact that God was so kind to give him the privilege 
of suffering in prison for the sake of Gentiles coming to know Christ. Isn't that an interesting perspective? Sometimes we think that uh, serving others for the sake of Christ is a bit of a drudgery and a sacrifice. Uh, I gotta pull up my sacrificial bootstraps and serve somebody today. Paul just counted it a privilege and a stewardship and a grace gift from God. It's a remarkable section. At the end of chapter three, verses 14 to 21 is the unfathomable love of God. And here we get more truth in a prayer. It begins, for this reason, I bow my knees before the Father. And then listen to this prayer. I I pray that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, verse 17, being firmly rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints, this is a collective community project, what is the breadth and length and height and depth And to know the love of Christ, which surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled up to all the fullness of God. Let's just back up and think about the dimensions here for a second. What is Paul praying? Paul prays that Ephesian believers would understand the breadth, the length, the height, the depth of what? Of, Of all this stuff of God and His redemptive plan, and particularly here, the the love of Christ. Things of infinite proportions. Paul prays that the Ephesian believers would know it. Then he says, I pray that you would know the love of Christ, which, do you see it? Surpasses knowledge. Man, what a prayer request. I pray that the Ephesian believers would know something that will forever be way beyond their comprehension. pray that they would know it and that they would be filled up. Well, how full? To what capacity? To the fullness of God. Every single one of these prayer requests exceeds the imagination and takes the prayer request to the infinite level, which is just remarkable. What will it mean for finite, puny human believers to comprehend infinite things? It just means we're never gonna be bored with God Uh, We're never going to get tired of this great explorative process, the scientific investigation of the love of God in Christ. What is Paul praying? Paul's praying for the Ephesian believers to delight in the God in whom he delights. And to what end, verse 21? To him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. It, It still is this doxological song. All of this is foundational to the therefores. Look at chapter 4, verse 1. You get the big therefore there. Uh, there's another therefore in uh, 4.25, another therefore in 5.1, another therefore in 5.15, another therefore in 6.13. And all of these therefores flow out of the theological foundation. So we talked about the truth you need to know, and now he's going to detail the life you need to live. And the first set of commands... Describe a walk of unity. Look at verse 1 of chapter 4. Therefore I, the prisoner in the Lord, do you feel it? Oh, Paul's in chains. And this is what's important to him, and this is what he's writing to us. I'm free. I, I can go about doing these things in the church. Paul doesn't even get to go to church. I exhort you to walk worthy of the calling with which you have been called. What does it mean to walk worthy of the calling with which you have been called? The rest of the book unfolds it, and it begins with this, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, being diligent to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body, one Spirit, you were called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God. The rest of this section down to verse 16 describes the church as a body, a unified organism. Paul in this section is commanding the church to actually pursue, to work at, to labor for unity, the bond of peace, grounded in love. There's a relationship here in this section between love and truth and unity right? A unity not around the truth is not good and it's not love. 
You can have a unity without love around some facts, and that's not the kind of unity he's after. But a love of Christ flowing out into a bond of love for one another will actually compel us to a a sweet kind of unity around the truth. That is what he's aiming at. And when he describes the illustration of the church as a body of of varied parts with various gifts and various abilities connected together in interdependence, they are to work together for one purpose. It culminates at the end of verse 16. For the building up of the body in love. It means that sanctification is a community project. It means that we're dependent on one another If you're an elbow in the body of Christ, you can't dislocate yourself and and go live an elbow life all by yourself and think you're going to thrive. God has placed us together for a purpose. And a purpose not about me. The purpose is about the body as a whole. To grow into the maturity of the fullness of the stature that belongs to Christ. A maturity that means that we're not blown around by every wind of doctrine. A maturity that means that we speak the truth to one another in love. And a maturity that means that each individual part is working properly and then joining itself to each other individual part to bring about the growth of the body. It's a remarkable picture. This is a walk of unity. Verse 17 introduces us to a walk of transformed thinking. Therefore, this I say and testify in the Lord, Paul writes, that you walk no longer just as the Gentiles also walk in the futility of their mind, being darkened in their mind, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them. That is uh, not, a, not a, a happy, innocent ignorance, but a willful suppression of the truth because of the hardness of their heart. They are callous. They give themselves over to sensuality. And you did not learn Christ this way. This is a countercultural walk that begins in the mind. Don't live the way you used to live out of darkened thoughts and darkened reasoning. You're different now. You learned Christ a different way. How did you learn Christ? Well, in Christ you learn to lay aside that old man and you learn to put on the new man. And you also learn, verse 23, to go on being renewed in the spirit of your mind. And then verses 25 to 32 gives us a bunch of illustrations about what a transformed life looks like. If your mind is being renewed, then you're going to think differently about things like lying, verse 25. Therefore, lay aside falsehood. How do you stop lying? Just stop saying deceitful things? Actually, you, you stop lying effectively when you start truth speaking. Um, verse 28, how do you stop being a thief? Uh, when, when I stop taking stuff from the local convenience store? Actually, you stop being a thief when your mind is renewed to rethink the whole thing about stuff. And the new man labors, performing with his own hands and doing what is good so that he will have something to share with one who is in need. A thief transformed by the gospel doesn't just stop stealing. He has his mind renewed by grace and he starts working, laboring with his own hands and being generous in giving to others. You see, this gospel transformation is a walk of life that is a total change beginning in the thinking In chapter 5, we see what is demanded of believers is a walk of love. Therefore, be imitators of God, Paul says, as beloved children. There's the trump card. Think about how you've been loved by God. How could you do otherwise than love others? Verse 2, and walk in love just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us. Paul moves on to a walk of light beginning in verse 7. Therefore, don't be partakers with the sons of disobedience. You were formerly darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. And then in verse 15, he moves us on to a walk of wisdom. Therefore, look carefully how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of opportunities, 
not being controlled by substances, but being governed by the Holy Spirit, speaking in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs to one another, giving thanks all the time in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, and subjecting yourselves to one another out of fear of Christ. And then there are these great particular applications of a walk of wisdom. Husbands and wives in chapter 5, children and parents beginning in chapter 6, verse 1, slaves and masters beginning in chapter 6, verse 5, And so this walk in wisdom encompasses every sphere of life. Gospel truths lead to gospel living. And then the last section of wise living has to do with a battle stance. A battle stance. Look at verse 10 of chapter 6. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the might of His strength. Put on the full armor of God so that you will be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. Take up the full armor of God, verse 13, so you will be able to resist in the evil day. And having done everything, stand firm. Notice throughout the book of Ephesians, we've been walking. Walking in darkness, walking in disobedience, and then walking in the gospel, walking in light, walking in love, walking in wisdom. Now you're going to fight spiritual battles against supernatural powers. Stand. It's interesting. The command here is is not rush into battle, Christian, but take up some significant defensive armaments. And I would encourage you to listen at length to the exposition of this section from Scott on the website. There is one offensive weapon in the armament, And it is verse 17, the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Just an applicational point here. If you're not reading your Bible, you are actually robbing the Holy Spirit of the implement He would use in your life to do battle that you need done. Just an encouragement to read your Bible. Notice that section closes with praying at all times with all prayer and petition in the Spirit, being alert with perseverance, not only for yourself, but for others. The letter concludes with some instructions and some encouragements. I want to give you one, two, three, four, five, six, seven themes to look for in the book of Ephesians in the next two minutes. Okay, so write these words down and you do your own survey and maybe you just circle every place these things come up and you need to trace out how important these things are. Uh, The first theme in the book of Ephesians that makes Ephesians kind of unique is its Trinitarian theme. So look for verses or little sections where the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are all involved in the same activity. There are these wonderful sort of Trinitarian anthems and refrains throughout the book. The second major theme is doxology, to glory, glory to God alone. Uh, just trace that through the whole book. And then a key phrase in the book of Ephesians, it happens some 35 times, is this little phrase, in Christ, or in Him, or in the Lord, and a couple places, in the Spirit. This sort of locational identity, where is a Christian? A Christian is in Christ defines who you are. It describes your life. This doctrine of in Christness is so rich in this book and being in Christ changes everything. Just trace that theme. Circle it everywhere you find it and see what Ephesians has to say. Really remarkable. Of course, grace. You've got to see grace in this book. Grace and salvation in Ephesians 2, 1 to 10, and then that section from Paul that's so personal in chapter 3, 1 to 13, grace in ministry. Just, if you're burnt out or disappointed at people or not sure if you're ready to wake up the next morning and and serve others, just read that section and discover again, circle those words gift and grace and given. Those are all the same word, by the way, in the original. And it's just this overwhelming sense that serving others in the church is a privilege. You need to check out the unity in the book. Just work that all the way through. The architectural illustrations of the church point to unity. Bricks in a building are no good by themselves strewn across a sidewalk. Bricks stacked together in the right order build a magnificent building in the Lord. 
Again, we've already talked about the illustration of the church as a body. There's a unity there. And then the other illustration of the church in the book is husbands and wives, a a picture of marriage, a unity with the Lord in that. So just trace out unity in the book. And then trace out the word walk. I'm going to say these fast. If you want to write them down, you can. 2 2 2 10 4 1 4 17 5 2 and 5 15. You didn't know I was going to do that, so I'm going to do that one more time. 2 2 2 10 4 1 4 17 5 2 5 15. What's fascinating about a walk is it is slow, takes in the sights. It's different than the Autobahn. You see stuff different when you're walking. It's methodical. Walking is one foot in front of the other, and then the other foot in front of the other, and the other foot in front of the other. And walking makes progress. It's a beautiful picture of the Christian life. It's a walk. And and you walked in darkness and slavery and sin prior to knowing Christ, and now in Christ, a different kind of walk. Trace that out through the book. And then finally, the word love. Harold Honer, in his excellent commentary on Ephesians, points out the absolute disproportionality of the word love in the book of Ephesians over and against all the other New Testament books and all the other Pauline letters. It is remarkably out of proportion in this book. You get the love of God for sinners and the grace of the gospel. You get the encouragements to walk in love in this book. And when Paul wrote a letter to Timothy, his protege, who is a pastor at Ephesus, when Paul wrote 1 Timothy, he wrote to Timothy, the goal of our instruction is love from a pure heart, love from a sincere conscience. Love was really important to Paul for these people in this letter. If there were ethnic tensions, what was going to bind people that were very different from each other together. Love in the gospel. What was going to be the fuel for unity and the perfect bond of peace? Selfless love. What's the bond of marriage in Ephesians 5? Christ-like sacrificial love. Love is all the way through this book. Notice how Ephesians ends. Grace be with all those who love our Lord Jesus Christ with incorruptible love. Four years later, Paul writes 1 Timothy 1.5, the goal of our instruction is love. And 30 years later, Jesus writes Ephesians, or Jesus writes 2 Ephesians, or Revelation 2, the letter to Ephesus in the book of Revelation. And do you remember what Jesus said about that church 30 years later? You heard the warnings about false teachers, false apostles, got them, ran them out of town. You hate the Nicolaitans and their deeds, the sexual immorality under the guise of Christianity. Yeah, I hate them too. Good job, Ephesus. Sound doctrine, you got it. But I have this against you. Do you remember Jesus' indictment against the church 30 years later? For the the, the church that got the letter that ends with (laughs) incorruptible love? Jesus says you have left your first love. Listen, if love leaves the building, you don't get to be a church anymore. Truth and love go together. Speak the truth in love, Paul wrote to the Ephesians. If you're you're holding on to truth but you don't love people, it's not really the truth. If you say you love people but it's not the truth, it's not really love. We can't abandon love. If the church is to survive and thrive and be a light for Jesus in the world, it must maintain this last command in Ephesians 6. Grace be with all those who love our Lord Jesus Christ with an incorruptible love. I'll close this in prayer and Chris, come lead us in that song one more time. Heavenly Father, thank you for this letter. We thank you for putting in your word to a church at Ephesus a letter that we would so desperately need. We pray that we would be humbled and amazed all over again by your grace for us in the gospel. I pray that we would not be intimidated or afraid of or negligent of theology, of truths we must know as foundational for life and the church. And then I pray that we would live the kind of lives that you expect from us. 
grounded in truth, fueled by love, walking in light, walking in wisdom in every realm. We ask it in Jesus' name.